Welcome to Access for All. I am your host, Robert Gorski, and along with Access for All team members, Wheelchair Boy and the Stone of Truth, I will talk with you about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA for short. On this program, we will finish unpacking how Title I of the ADA protects people with disabilities from employment discrimination based on disability. That is the main course of this program, but before we get to there, here are a few brief information appetizers related to previous shows. In the last program, I'm accommodating, are you, Wheelchair Boy provided information about a national disability inclusion law in Mexico. Now, Wheelchair Boy has learned of a new development in Poland that shows the influence of America's ADA. At the end of last year, an Accessibility Council was created in Poland to recommend to the national government a new law to advance accessibility nationwide. You're now looking at a, the national symbol of, past, of uh, Poland. It's called the White Eagle. Uh, the council is comprised of 50 members from various government bodies, disability groups, and academia. And it will work to implement a program called Accessibility Plus, which aims to eliminate barriers in architecture, transportation, education, healthcare, and other services. Now, for something from the other side of the access coin. The very first access for all, entitled The Great Hand of the ADA, included a review of accessible parking spaces. I would like to share with you something that makes me grind my teeth in smoldering anger. If you know anything about the famous literary work from the Italian Renaissance, popularly referred to as Dante's Inferno, you are aware of the concept of the realm of hell having nine levels, or rings, for various degrees of sinning. Actually, there are 10 rings, because in between rings five and six is ring 5A. This ring is reserved for people who leave shopping carts in accessible parking spaces. Here is a particularly egregious instance where people left three carts in such a space. One day these people will get their comeuppance by spending eternity stuffed inside a shopping cart on ring A of the inferno. And don't think that leaving your shopping cart in the access aisle means you will avoid such damnation. On every access aisle, in large painted letters, are the words, no parking. And that applies to everything from cars and horse-drawn carriages to shopping carts and baby strollers. Now, stone of truth, am I right or not? The stone of truth is a piping hot yes. Okay, let's finish talking about Title I of the ADA. Today's program is called Four More Scenarios. Today's key phrase is no cost or low cost. At the end of the last Access for All program, there was only time to describe the first two scenarios from an excellent video from the 1990s about employment and disability. Each scenario had two scenes. One scene dramatizes a problem, and the second shows a successful outcome. And success comes through accommodations that are either low cost or no cost at all. The first scenario concerned a person who was blind applying for a white collar position. The accommodation for him, simply listening to him explain how he can successfully accomplish the job tasks with some extra technological devices that he already owns. The second scenario depicted a warehouse new hire with a limitation on how much weight he could carry. In this scenario, the accommodation was an inexpensive cart 
on which he could roll heavy electrical equipment to and from his repair bench. Here are the other scenarios. The third scenario is set in a department store. The cosmetic manager is behind the counter talking with a job applicant who is in front of the counter with her back to the camera. The manager's face has a slightly painful expression as the applicant speaks of her background, experience in cosmetic sales, and enthusiasm for working with people. As the applicant affirms her interest in the sales counter position, the camera circles around to show the front of the applicant. Now we know the reason for the manager's painful expression, and perhaps we share it, because the applicant has a hair lip that is quite obvious. Now, a hair lip is a physical condition that does not by itself meet the ADA definition of disability because it does not significantly impact a major life activity. But if the manager regards that physical condition as the reason for not hiring the applicant, the applicant becomes a person with a disability because her hair lip is being regarded as a physical impairment that prevents her from a major life activity known as employment. In the next scene, the applicant is behind the counter concluding a sale of cosmetics with a customer who packages her sale and walks off camera. Then the former job applicant looks into the camera and explains that when people stop focusing on just two inches of a person's face and look at the whole person, they can see what that person can really contribute to the job. This is an example of a no-cost accommodation. Was it reasonable? Surely the employer runs a huge undue risk of scaring away customers, right? Not really. Experience proves that this fear is merely a cobweb from the past. That is why Title I of the ADA prohibits using coworker or customer fear and anxiety as a reason not to hire, promote, or accommodate. The situation could be much different if the job applicant has an easily communicable disease. But then, then the decision not to hire would be based on the pro prospect of eminent and significant harm to others. In this instance, the employer's decision is not based on fear and anxiety, but on objective, reasonable, and actual factual evidence. Still, the employer is obligated to engage in the interactive process to explore if some accommodation could be made that would be reasonable. You don't really know until you start discussing. The fourth scenario is another example of a no-cost accommodation. In the first scene, a legal secretary who is hard of hearing is in her boss's office listening to her supervisor grimly say that the firm's lawyers report that the secretary is failing to produce accurate notes from staff meetings. The secretary explains that staff meetings often turn raucous, with many people talking loudly at once and turning their faces away from her, and she is unable to follow what they are saying. The second scene in the video shows the solution to the problem. The secretary is at a staff meeting, which just begins to turn raucous. She holds out her hands and says, ladies and gentlemen, as we all agreed, let's calm down so I and everyone can understand what someone is saying. Then the secretary turns to the camera and explains that allowing her to calm things down allows her to take accurate notes. And by the way, it also helps the staff have more productive 
and more collegial meetings. Another example of a no-cost accommodation is the video's fifth scenario. In the first scene, a car sales manager is looking at a scoreboard showing the name of each salesperson and gold stars after each name. At the bottom of the board, salesman Bob has only one lonely gold star. The manager looks out to the sales floor and sees a salesman who uses a wheelchair talking with a couple. The couple shake their heads negatively and walk away. The salesman looks dejected and frustrated. Another person inside the office remarks to the manager that someone should tell Bob that he is in danger of being let go. The manager looks sad and says, no, not now. Bob has enough trouble enough with his disability. The next scene has Bob rolling out of the manager's office smiling and eager. Looking into the camera, Bob explains that he went to the manager and asked for help to do a better job. Then he says, finally, the boss treated me as just another salesman. He told me what I was doing wrong and gave me great tips on how better to sell cars. This giving of constructive criticism to an employee with a disability is an accommodation under Title I of the ADA that is just as important as making a training facility accessible to that employee. The sixth and last scenario features an accommodation that any employer could afford. In the first scene, an office manager is talking with a clerical employee who has returned to work after surgery that amputated one hand. The employee explains that he is able to perform all his tasks except filing. The office has a huge amount of hard copy files and they are packed into filing cabinets too tightly for the employee with only one hand to return files to their proper place. The employer asks the manager, I'm sorry, the employee asks the manager to purchase a large number of additional file cabinets and find room somewhere in the office for them so that files can be more loosely stored. The manager's face has the look of a deer caught in the lights of an automobile. The second scene shows the clerical employee opening a tightly packed file cabinet, sticking a flat metal ruler in between two files, twisting the ruler 90 degrees to open a space between the files, slipping a file folder into the open space, and then pulling the flat metal ruler out from the files. Turning to the camera, the clerk explains that a coworker came up with the idea of the flat metal ruler, which costs less than $2. These scenarios all underscore that an accommodation is any change in the work facility, the work process, or the employment policies, benefits, and privileges that allows a person with a disability to achieve job or application performance. How does one determine when an accommodation is unreasonable? It depends on whether the accommodation represents an undue hardship for the employer. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces Title I of the ADA. Here is what the commission says about undue hardship. Undue hardship can be claimed when an accommodation requires significant difficulty or expense when considered in light 
of a number of factors. These factors include the nature and cost of the accommodation in relation to the size, resources, nature, and structure of the employer's operation. In general, a larger employer is expected to make accommodations requiring greater effort or expense than is required of a smaller employer. To put it another way, a request for reasonable accommodation should be evaluated to determine if it would impose an undue hardship, taking into account the nature and cost of the accommodation needed, the impact of the accommodation on the work of the business, the effect on expenses and resources of the business, and the overall financial resources of the business. Now, regarding that last point about overall resources, where the facility making the accommodation is part of a larger entity, the structure and overall resources of the larger organization should be considered, as well as the financial and administrative relationship of the facility to the larger organization. For example, a small department of a large corporation may not have the budget to improve access to a restroom that the department's employees use. For that department, the improvement may be an undue hardship financially. But it is the larger corporation which is responsible for compliance with Title I. And that is the context in which undue hardship is determined. Now let's review the most important ideas that have been discussed in this and the two previous Access for All programs. Whether you are a person with a disability or an employer, in order to advocate for your rights or to avoid being the perpetrator of discrimination, you need to be familiar with at least several key concepts. First, the ADA definition of disability and that Title I includes the concept of being qualified for the job in question. Second, the interactive process. Third, reasonable accommodation. And fourth, undue hardship. A great portion of the information in this and the preceding Access for All programs on employment and disability has come from publications available from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. Its website has a great amount of information. Let's see for ourselves. On the EEOC homepage, I will put my cursor over about EEOC. And from a drop-down menu, I will choose Publications and click on that. On the next display, I'm going to scroll down to Americans with Disabilities Act. And then I'm going to go over to the right margin and click on the plus sign. That opens up a large number of very interesting publications. Uh, among them are ADA questions and answers, uh, your rights as an employer, even very specific publications such as living with HIV infection, your legal rights in the workplace under the ADA. There's one down here near the bottom, I'll put my cursor on it, it says Compliance Manual Section 902, definition of the term disability. Now, if you click on that, a display appears telling you that the, the manual is no longer available. Still, it's a great piece of information. The reason it's no longer available is that some court decisions and the uh, congressional amendments to the ADA in 2008 made certain parts of the manual out of date. 
But the manual, as I said, is still a great resource for learning about the ADA. And it's still available on the internet. So I'm going to go back and this time we'll type in ADA Title I Assistance Manual. And there it is at the top of the list, Technical Assistance Manual for Title I of the ADA. Let's click on that. And up comes the JAN, Job Accommodation Network website. It comes up to the actual beginning of the manual. And I, the manual's very long. I'll just show you some uh, initial pages. Uh, there's an introduction, of course, how to use the manual, requirements, who must comply with the Title I of the ADA, special situations, who is exempt from applying. And it goes on and on for many pages. Uh, it is quite long, but it's done in a very readable fashion. The uh, language is very readable. And in addition, there's lots of illustrations and examples to help you understand the, very, the basic concepts of the ADA. As I said, this is the uh, website of the Job Accommodation Network. That has been in business for about 30 years. It's a nonprofit uh, website uh, organized by, the, uh, by an Eastern University. And it's a wonderful uh, resource for uh, people's ex uh, employer's experience with uh, accommodating on the job people with disabilities and actual uh, advice and products and various kinds of uh, ways that people with disabilities have been successfully accommodated on the job. Now there is another, there are various and sundry uh, uh, websites on the internet about Title I and the ADA and employment and people with disabilities. So there's a lot of information out there. I've just showed you the, the tip of the iceberg. But the two that I find the most uh, helpful are the EEOC and its web page of uh, publications and the Job Accommodations Network. Now let's go to the great hand of the ADA and sort of quickly review the, the various areas of coverage. The first one is Title I, Employment. We spent the last two and a half programs on this. And let's remember that there's five areas of coverage. The second, which is called Title IIA, is public services. And that refers to state and local governments. The third area of coverage is called Title IIB. And that's called public transportation. That covers things like the MTA bus system and the light rail system. It does not cover taxi cabs. That is because taxi cabs are not a form of publicly run transportation. Although it is in the public realm, it's a private sector business. And Title III public accommodations covers all businesses in the private sector, both profit and nonprofit. The last of the five areas of coverage is Title IV, called telecommunications. It's a relatively small section that deals with the telephone company and the necessity for it to provide ways that people who are deaf or people who are, have speaking impairments can access, can use the telephone system to access other people and other businesses. Other businesses. Now, in our next, um, let me take a quick look also at something called the U.S. Access Board. Uh, if I could type correctly, got to get those periods in there correctly. It's U.S. Actually, we just have to type access hyphen board dot gov. And you are at a marvelous resource on architectural accessibility standards. We don't have a lot of time to discuss it any further, but this will be a very important uh, tool that we'll see in the next 
uh, Access for All program, which is called Strolling Pasadena. We're going to look at Title IIA and the city's responsibilities for accessible pedestrian uh, navigation of our streets and sidewalks. Um, and this is very important for a lot of people, not just uh, people who use wheelchairs, but people who use canes and crutches and people who are blind. The program's going to cover such things as curb ramps, sidewalk sandwich boards, tree wells, and 17,000 sidewalk uplifts. As always, please tell friends, neighbors, and colleagues about Access for All. Everyone should be interested in the ADA because hardly anyone goes through life without a temporary or permanent experience with disability. In fact, people who do not have a disability today are temporarily able-bodied, TABs for short. I wish all people with disabilities and all TABs well, and let's look to the day when the Pledge of Allegiance concludes with liberty, justice, and access for all.